Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kieran. Hello, Gary. I was in his presentation, so I have to put Gary in my presentation. Um, this is really sp special for me because two years ago at PHP UK in 2015, I did my first ever conference talk upstairs uh, on the big track. It was the first time I'd ever talked in front of people. I've done quite a lot of talks since then, but this is still a really sort of special conference to me because I came to it for years before I ever did any speaking. Uh, and if you did see Gary's uh, keynote last night, I can really attest to what he was saying that becoming more engaged in the community and getting more involved in open source not only is really sort of personally rewarding, but you get more money, uh, <laughs> which is the, the main takeaway I had from that talk. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is this thing, <clears throat> driving design through examples. And it comes from a set of practices called modeling by example. This is a, uh, a term coined by uh, Konstantin Kudryashov. And it's, it's, it's a kind of set of different practices. So I'm going to talk through kind of what it is, but it's not a really strict checkpoint thing. Uh, you can't say, yes, you're doing modeling by example or not. And it combines some concepts from BDD and some concepts from DDD. So I'll give a bit of a sort of primer in the relevant concepts from each and sort of show how it comes together in a particular workflow for building software and show some code examples and stuff. But we're not, it's not really going to be focused on the tools that we're using. Oh, I forgot to say who I was. I, uh, I work for a company called Invika, who have a big stand out there. And I'm lead maintainer of a project called PHP Spec. And I do a lot of coaching and uh, programming and things for people. So let's start with BDD. Behavior-driven development is <clears throat> quite well established now. A lot of teams think they're do it, doing it, but they're not. <laughs> they're just writing weird tests. Um, what's the point of BDD? It's that the behavior of the system is what's going to drive your development. We've got too many DD acronyms in this industry, but we're only going to cover a couple of them. Um, so what does behavior mean? It means we're going to start our process by talking about how the system should work. Which sounds obvious, but lots of people don't do that. They start it by opening an editor and typing stuff. Maybe we're going to have a conversation with someone about what it's supposed to do before we get to that point. And it's got many focuses. It's about building things well. <coughs> so having conversations and documenting how parts of your system should work, maybe in the form of executable tests, is going to help build quality into your application. You want to build the right thing, so we also want to figure out, my unit tests are going to tell me I've built the thing that I thought I was building. Um, I also need to kind of figure out, is it the thing I was supposed to be building, which is sometimes different. And another part of BDD we're not going to focus on much is building things for the right reasons. So a lot of BDD conferences, people are talking about project goals and how do you know if your project succeeded to achieve the business metrics that we wanted and that kind of much higher level stuff. So maybe that's confusing. Um, a, a good definition of BDD is Liz Keogh's definition. BDD is when you use examples in conversation to illustrate behavior. Behavior is this input leads to this output. And an example is a particular way of communicating. I'll stop fiddling with this. Why examples? Um, examples aren't actually that important to understand. What you really want is the person who's building the system has a mental model of, of the rules of the system that match the person who's paying them to do it or match the business needs that that's going to be uh, fulfilled. So really, we kind of want to understand rules. Here are some rules. The problem with rules is they are broad, and so it's hard to make sure the person you're talking to understands what you're saying. So we're going to work through an example that's a kind of um, loyalty scheme for frequent flying, because it's a sort of pet hobby. Um, we're going to start a budget airline that flies between London and Manchester. And the thing that's important for the people who are going to implement this system 
it's important that they understand these rules. And a business will often start talking to you in the format of trying to explain the rules to you. So the rules are, every one pound I spend on flights, I earn a point. 100 points can rede be redeemed for 10 pounds off a future flight. It's a very simple scheme. Uh, and flights are taxed at 20%. Now, these might be the rules that are explained to you, the development team, which I include, you know, testers and all the different types of developers. Project managers, maybe. Get some credit. Um, there's a whole load of other rules that are implicit to the business of flying that the customer aren't going to remember to tell you about. So there's a lot of assumptions they're making when they're conveying these rules, and it's easy to read these rules and get a slightly wrong understanding. Can anyone see any ambiguities in here? You just shout one out. Yeah, who? Do I get a point for a pound I spend on flights? Yeah, that's a good point. So if it's 100 pounds and I spend 120 pounds, how many points should I get? So what I've done there is I've asked the question with real numbers in, and that's going to transform it into an example. What's the actual number of points I earn if the flight costs 100 pounds? You had one over there? So if I sp I'll repeat it for the thing. If I spend £1.49, how many points do I get? Do we have fractions of points? So even with very simple cases where you, you think, I'll just, explain the, I'll just tell them the rules and they'll understand and they'll build the software correctly. I've got a context that I'm measuring these rules against. Like obviously in my industry, it's really obvious where the points get awarded for the tax because it's how everyone does it. And I'm not going to think to mention it as part of the conversation. Or obviously in our industry, we know that things get rounded. Like I've been in the airline industry for 50 years and it's always been done this way. And the poor developer who implemented the rounding thing gets told they're an idiot because why would you ever do it that way? So introducing examples here are what's going to reduce this ambiguity. Even for simple cases, you just say, so give me an example of when I'm flying and it costs 100 pounds. The kind of questions I like, that I came up with, well, when I, when I redeem, when I've got a flight that I'm going to earn points on and I use some points to lower the cost, do I still earn points back on it? Maybe that's a good question to answer before the end of the project. Um, can I spend 200 points and get 20 pounds off? This tax thing, if I've got money off, is the tax related to what you're talking about. If I've reduced the cost by spending points, does that reduce the tax? Or is there some crazy tax law that we have to add to our list of rules? And this kind of conversation is the, kind of, is the bread and butter of behavior-driven development. Techniques for asking this kind of question, making sure everyone understands the rules before they build the software. That's basically what BDD is about. It's not about um, figuring out what the user interface is going to be, or uh, like writing the code at, at, up front and generating UML. It's just about making sure everyone understands this kind of behavior of the system. What should the system do in these different cases? And the examples become unambiguous. So for the same set of rules, we can quickly, through a conversation, generate some examples. Um, so let's say a flight from London to Manchester costs 50 pounds. If you pay cash, you'll pay an additional 10 pounds tax and you'll earn 50 points. If you pay entirely with points, so you can throw as many points as you like onto it. If you pay entirely with points, it will cost 500 points and you'll have to pay the tax on the original price before the discount. Ah. And you don't earn any more points because it's a like, re reward flight of some sort. Uh, and there's a scenario here. If I pay, just get some of the price off. This is what should happen. So this becomes a lot more understandable. Oh, in this room you can't read the bottom of the slides. I forgot. So if you pay with 100 points, it will cost 100 points, and you'll have to pay the rest of the cost, and you pay the tax based on the original cost before you reduce it with points. So these... Sorry? You know, you don't earn points at all on a reward flight. So often through these conversations, you discover a new rule. So you could, you could annotate that in your rules, you know. Oh, if you spend any points on a flight, you don't earn any new points. Something like that. 
So these are harder to understand, that's quite important, but there are, it would be easier for everyone involved if someone could just explain the rules and then I immediately understand the rules and we, I go and build the software. But in real life, there's normally some kind of ambiguity. So you can think of examples maybe as, as an algorithm in one person's head and there's an algorithm that's been formed in the other person's head based on the chat you had and then you run some real numbers through it and if the same real numbers pop out for both people, we've got a high confidence we both understood what the hell we were talking about. And if different numbers pop out, we probably need to talk a bit more. And I can say, hey, why, like you just did, why am, why am I not earning points here? What's the hidden rule we didn't talk about yet? So that's BDD. Uh, and at the end, everyone understands what they're meant to be doing. There's an amazing side effect the examples are objectively testable. So by generating these examples as a way for us to understand what we're supposed to be doing, we've also generated three test cases. So I can, once the system's been implemented, I can validate that it works by setting up a flight that costs 50 pounds, trying to pay for it with cash, checking I get charged 10 pounds uh, tax and checking that I get 50 points credited to my loyalty account. This is why BDD is so intimately connected with uh, test automation. The conversation you have at the start leads you towards having nice test cases that cover all the important things the business cares about. You might have other tests later covering things the tester cares about that they thought of when they were testing, but it means you've got this kind of synchronization point. We checked we both understood what we're supposed to be building and we wrote it down and we can use that to drive automated tests later. So in BDD, this step of taking those cases and generating test cases, uh, obviously there are tools to help with that. Let's look at Gherkin. Gherkin is a formal language for writing down examples. You do not have to use Gherkin. So there are tools that will make it easier for you if you're using this format. The most important thing is to talk to people and deliberately introduce examples into the conversation and say, can you give me an example? What would happen if I paid 100 pounds? And write that down. That's the most important thing. Writing it down in Gherkin format and using the tools that can automate Gherkin format will make your life easier, but it's just like a convenience step. You should only automate it once you're doing it correctly. Don't automate it when you're doing it badly. You just do bad stuff faster, more efficiently. And Gherkin looks like this. Um, you have a file called a feature file. You get uh, a nice bit of free text where you can just stick stuff in there. Here's my understanding of the rules. Please see the, this page on the wiki. Uh, here's the user story that made us build this feature. Here's a picture of my cat anything you want to kind of stick in there that's going to help someone who reads this file later. And then the formal bit is these scenarios. So there's a keyword scenario, and then you say what scenario you're going to describe. So these are the three we had before. Paying cash and earning points. Uh, getting some money off the flight using points. What should happen? What should happen if I pay for the flight entirely with points? Then inside each scenario, you have a bunch of steps. The most important things are the when and the then. When this happens, this should happen. This input should lead to this output. We have a thing called given, which is like, why is that input leading to that output? What happened in the past? What states the system in? That means when you do this, this is going to happen. So you can focus just on the top scenario. But these are, I wrote out the three scenarios. Given a flight costs 50, 50 pounds, so there's this concept like already in the world there's a flight been set up that costs 50 pounds. Someone went and typed it into the flight system. When I pay with cash, so that's the input, someone does something that indicates they're paying, push a button or type a command or something. Then I should pay £50 for the flight and I should pay £10 tax and I should get 50 points. So 
So we're not talking about a particular user interface, we're just writing down these business rules. That, we're writing down examples of the business rules we talked about. What's the system supposed to protect? And I do the same for the, for the other scenarios. Uh, and we'll see in a minute, you can use tools like BHAT. Um, there's a family of tools basically called Cucumber, and BHAT is the PHP uh, tool that will help you write tests based on this format. Uh, you could just write this down as text and use PHP unit and write tests following the outline and it'll be perfectly fine. Cucumber workflow is a bit more efficient if you're doing this Gherkin thing a lot. So who writes these things? There's a concept called the three amigos. They're sometimes called three amigos sessions, but don't let normal people call you, hear you calling that them that because uh, they think developers are weird enough anyway. Um, you need someone who understands the business rules. So in a Scrum context, you might have someone called a product owner. There'll be someone, some subject matter expert who can take part in the conversation. Uh, you need someone who's good at validation, a tester. They're also really good at asking these sort of, but what would happen in if, and finding an extra case that the, where are the gaps in the rules? They're really good at identifying those things. And you need someone who's gonna be building the thing. Offer, offer alternatives. It's important that they understand the requirements, so it's important they're in the room. When do you do it? So before you start working on that feature, that's the last point at which you can do it, just before you start typing. Don't do it too long before. You don't have this conversation about an entire 12-month program of work and try and write out Gherkin scenarios for everything. It's a massive waste of time because as anyone who's worked on a long project knows, you won't do half of that stuff and you'll actually build a load of other stuff no one mentioned at the start. So, you know, not too long before, a few days before you're about to work on it. Probably before you commit to a particular time scale for doing it, you have to do, have the conversation. So if you're doing Scrum, for instance, you probably want to do this before your sprint planning. If someone's going to say how much work you're going to get done, you, you want to understand. And you have to optimize it for whenever you've got access to the right people. So ideally, I've got all these business experts and testers and developers all sitting together in a room, constantly trying to make the software better. But the reality of life might be different. You might have a business expert you get to talk to every two months for a half hour meeting, and you have to cram this conversation in. So sometimes you want to make these conversations very formal and say, we're doing the, we call it an example workshop. We're going to do an example workshop for the stuff we're doing in the next sprint. You're invited. Please come. <laughs> and once you've got a few examples, which are called scenarios as well, as part of the conversation, you drive, you know, what, We've identified a few scenarios. What, new, what other scenarios can we think of? I think I got these lists, this list of questions from Liz Keogh. I get most things from Liz Keogh. Um, when would this outcome not be true? So you've got a scenario saying I spend 100 pounds and I get 50 points. You can start asking questions like, are there any cases where I wouldn't earn the points if I spent 100 pounds? Having those real values in there is gonna help. Oh yeah, actually, if you're a member of staff, you won't earn the points. And suddenly you've discovered a whole new set of stories that you're gonna to have to build about uh, staff discounts. What other outcomes are there? I earn the points, but also something else happens. Like I get a ticket, or I go on an airplane. There's probably other, other things that happen. One of the biggest problems you see with, with people trying to do BDD is the only outcome they have is I see a message on the screen. And you kind of say, that's an easy test to pass. When I click the button, I should see, congratulations, you've purchased a holiday. That's easy to implement. You just echo some strings. There's probably other things are happening. Something gets reserved in another system. Does this implementation detail matter? It's, it's natural for people to start talking about, I want a button I can click, but just don't capture that in the, in the scenario. You can, there's better ways to talk to people about user interfaces, more graphical ways maybe with a marker on a whiteboard and wireframes. Trying to capture UI detail in text is, is pretty much a waste of time. But remember, these things aren't contracts. It's a conversation you're having to try and understand what to build. You're not forming a contract and you're gonna hit them over the head with it if they change their minds. It's just a kind of living document. This is what we think is gonna work. 
It's a shared understanding of a feature. It's a starting definition of done. So like, if we don't have another conversation between now and me finishing the work, and it does all these things, everyone's going to be happy. But, hope, but you might have a better idea. The business might come up with a much better idea tomorrow. And we can re re revisit it, have another conversation. They give an objective indication of how to test a feature. So I touched on that. Even if you're not doing automated testing, having examples is going to give you a bunch of test cases. So you can get a person to read the eight scenarios you generated for that feature and just check each one works, manually testing it. Obviously, you'll want to automate it because I think most of the people in the room are developers and are lazy, so we don't want to sit there clicking on things. Even testers don't want to sit there clicking on things. They want to be doing exploratory testing and thinking about the system. So that's essentially BDD in 20 minutes. Let's talk about domain-driven design. Um, DDD is a different DD. And the hardest thing to remember is that the last D stands for design, not development. And as long as you can remember that, you're, you're one up on most people. So domain-driven design is a different set of practices. And the point of domain-driven design is that the domain model, the business model, the business understanding, drives the design of your system. So BDD is about be the behavior of the system is integrated into the workflow of the development of how we build the system. DDD is that the understanding of the business is central to the way we write the software. So we try and understand the business first, perhaps, and then make the software reflect that understanding as much as possible. DDD is a very, DDD is a very big field. Like BDD, there's no crisp boundary to it where you say this, this is in or out of DDD. It's just a bunch of people talking about how to do software correctly. But Eric Evans had a nice phrase from his DDD book. It tackles complexity by focusing the team's attention on model of the knowledge of the domain. And it's something that a lot of development teams shy away from. They don't want to invest time in understanding the business. They want to ignore as many details of the business as possible to keep the domain model simple. So the business tell you about all these complex things that we have to deal with. And as developers, sometimes we say, OK, so I'll build you a form. And that will save the stuff in the database. And all of those rules you just told me about, you can enforce them in your head when you're typing stuff into the form. <laughs> and, and, and my model is going to be really simple. I'm just saving some stuff. When you invest time in trying to understand the rules of, of a business, really pays off in the software. The software suddenly does stuff for businesses uh, instead of uh, when you've got a very weak understanding of the business domain and you build a CRUD system. All of those rules are still there. They're just being enforced manually by people. They're looking at one field and typing it into another place in a different page. <laughs> that kind of nonsense. You as a developer have to understand the business and build systems that make things easier for the people who use the systems. So how do you do that? There's an important concept in DDD called ubiquitous language. <laughs> Turns out all of these practices come down to communicating better with people. <laughs> Human, uh, computers can communicate with each other really well. It's people communicating with people is always, is always the hard bit. So a ubiquitous language is a shared way of talking about domain concepts. It means when I say a particular word to do with the business, Everyone else in the team understands what that word means via a kind of telepathy. So it's hard to achieve. It means we're all, talk we're all on the same page. We're all using the same terms to talk about things in the software. And it reduces the cost of translation when business and developers communicate. You sometimes get a situation where the business person says the invoice doesn't have any line items on it. And the developer has to mentally translate that and say, what you're saying is that the finance item list aggregate doesn't have any finance items attached to it. Because I've called it something different in the software to the thing that the real people use to refer to the same concept. Um, and that's, the co that's what cost of translation means. Every time we're having a conversation, we're having to map 
business concepts onto code concepts that are using a different vocabulary and different relationships between things. And it's a small cost, but it really adds up. So we should try and establish and use terms that the business are going to understand. So when there's a problem, a modeling problem in the code, I can explain it to someone in the business and they'll understand what I'm talking about. That's the idea. <laughs> I'm not sure what should happen when there are no line items on the invoice. How do we resolve that? And the finance expert can tell you because they figured out how to do that in the 18th century uh, and, and the modeling problem's actually been solved in the real world. Oh, you have two lists and you put it in both lists and we call it double ledger. And you have to learn all this stuff, but then the system's gonna really map well onto the business. Wow, that's good. So modeling by example um, is a phrase coined by this guy Everzet, who uh, works with me at Invica probably a year and a half ago. Um, I wanted him to call it BDDDDD, uh, <laughs> and he didn't go for it. And it's a few things. A few things came, came together. So we were doing BDD. Um, he played a big part in, in embedding BDD practices into Invica. Um, and we were trying to you know, work out how to be as effective as possible using behavior-driven development. So we're having these conversations with customers to uh, come up with examples of the system's behavior. We're putting a lot of time and effort into, into having these conversations. And we've, we started to realize that this DDD concept of ubiquitous language really applied. That the requirements conversations went a lot better when you're also trying to understand the complexity of the business. So you're not having the conversations as a kind of requirements dump conversation. Just tell me what you want and I'll build it for you. Leave me alone. Um, you're really digging into the business and asking a lot of active questions. So in his blog post, which blew my mind when I read it, um, here's the core proposition of modeling by example. If you put enough effort into the, this example-driven conversation, it can also become a venue for doing your domain modeling live with the business you're going to be building the system for in a way they can understand because you're just talking. Cool. So there are some principles. The best way to understand the domain model is by discussing examples. So what's the domain model? Let's just cover that briefly. The domain model isn't the code, and it's not a drawing. You, if you ever worked on a project where you have to generate UML diagrams for everything, it drives you insane. The domain model is this kind of fuzzy thing in the middle where it's the shared understanding the whole team, the developers, the testers, the business have of how the system operates. And the code is one representation of the, the domain model. Your documentation is another representation of the domain model. The tests are another representation of the domain model. So we start looking at the BDD scenario as a representation of your domain model and one of the tools we can use to build a better system. And by doing some of our modeling up front, iteratively, feature by feature, but by doing some of our modeling, by having conversations with the business, the code gets easier because we've kind of worked out a lot of the modeling problems before we, get, before we hit the code. So we're going to write scenarios that deliberately capture ubiquitous language. So the scenarios I showed earlier were fine for doing uh, a lot of BDD and a lot of um, automated testing afterwards, but they weren't really focused on trying to understand how that business talks about things. The scenario should illustrate real situations, so as much as possible, get real data in there, real detail, and then directly drive the way you write the code from the examples. So a lot of people will generate examples, then write the code, then use the examples to generate automated tests. This is at this kind of feature level. Um, 
I'm going to directly drive the code model in a way that's much more similar to test-driven development in a much tighter loop. Yeah, that just about covers it. Uh, so we now go on to the second half where we show you how to do that kind of thing. So <clears throat> I'm going to directly drive the code model. So just out of interest, who's using bhat? Who's using bhat at a layer other than driving the user interface of your application? Just Jacob? Oh, no, a few other people. So bhat is one of this um, family of tools called Cucumber. You write out in natural language, I'm going to say English from now on, but you can use other languages. Um, you write out in English some examples of the behavior of the system, and then you use this tool to drive your real application based on those outlines, and then the tool says yes or no to whether it works. Sounds good. And because most people interact with software through a user interface, and in our case, probably at least 80% of the projects we're talking about are web projects, right? It's very natural to say, well, this is the way, hopefully I've got some kind of layering in my application. You may not. Um, you might be using Active Record. Uh, I've got some UI and I've got some sort of core bit. If I'm really advanced, the core bit might be split out into a few other layers, like a domain layer and an application layer. And I've got some infrastructure like databases and queues and things that I have to talk to. And because a user interacts through the UI, the most natural way to use bhat is to use bhat to drive your user interface. And that's okay. Um, try not to have that user interface detail in your scenarios. But, uh, you know, this is what most people are doing. There are problems, though. Someone shout out the problems with UI testing. Slow. Yeah, it's really slow. Anything else? Changes all the time. Bloody front-end developers keep removing my CSS selectors. Yeah, and it's kind of fragile. Um, things time out, and then you run the build again, and it's fine the second time around. But it's a three-hour build. So the first time it timed out, and then I restarted it, and it passed the second time. So that's how I spent my day. I did a code change, waited for it to fail, restarted the build, and passed. Felt productive, went home. <laughs> um, and that's just the nature of it. You know, when you're going through the UI, you're going through a whole load of stuff. You're testing that the web works. You're testing that uh, Nginx works. You're testing that databases retrieve records when you ask them to retrieve records. There's a lot of stuff involved. So the user interface probably iterates quicker than your business rules do, at least for a lot of established businesses. They, you know, finance companies don't change their rules as often as they refresh their work, their UI flow through the user interface. Um, and I don't have a slide about it, but What's happening is that when we're testing for the user interface, assuming we've got these nice BDD scenarios, they're capturing business cases. When you test through the UI, what you're doing is you're making sure your user interface supports those business cases in a nice way. So there's a kind of pressure, a very strong pressure, that if your user interface doesn't actually support those actions, the tests are going to fail. Right? But between the UI and the domain model, there's another layer. There's an API here. There's things that your controller calls in the, in the core of your application. And there's nothing that's making sure that that's a good API that supports the business cases. There's nothing that's making sure the logic is separated out between these layers. So important practice in modeling by example is to test the domain first. Test the code first. Make something that works, and then hook it up to a user interface. That's an interesting concept. Um, don't build the, build the whole application without a user interface for six months. That would be crazy. We're just saying when you're working on a feature, get it working in PHP first. And then, then we'll think about the user interface. 
There's still a problem here if I'm testing my domain model with the real infrastructure. Similar problems. It's going to be slow. If I'm testing it with a real MySQL thing. It's going to be slower than if I was just testing PHP. It's going to be brittle. I've worked places where we have an expensive license for the database because someone made a bad decision. Um, and the developers can't have a database, especially when they're on the train. So there's a lot of, lot of disadvantages to testing with infrastructure. When you look at the kind, when, you, when you're testing a bunch of business cases and you're using the real infrastructure, sometimes you look at what the real database is doing and you're like, I've got a thousand tests and in each case it's just doing find by ID. I don't need to test a thousand times that find by ID works on this table. I'm pretty confident that's going to work. I want to test these interesting different business cases work. So you can get rid of your infrastructure as well. And just test your middle layer. We're going to test the database later, but let's not worry about it immediately. So modeling by example, you start by writing good scenarios, and then you test the core of your application. Let's talk about the scenarios. Here's what I started with. These are fine for testing. It's easy to read them. You understand what's happening in each case. Um, they're good for verification. However, when I come and build this system, there's not a lot there to help me. As a developer, I'm going to have to come up with a domain model. There isn't really a domain model there. There's just inputs and outputs. So this is, the, this is what in modeling by example we're trying to add. I want to add some domain modeling. Um, I'm going to add some detail. And if the detail doesn't map with the business's understanding, they're going to notice it because this is in English, and they're going to tell me. If I'm adding a complicated domain model in my code, no one's ever going to look at that, and they're not going to tell me that I'm wrong. So one thing is to add realistic details. Um, there isn't a lot of detail, for instance, about which flight I'm, get, I'm taking. Um, it just says a flight. Let's, let's talk a bit about what flights are. <laughs> um, you can ask questions like... Sorry, I'll just show you the slide. A flight from London to Manchester costs 50 pounds. <coughs> Background is just like context that's going to apply to all of the scenarios. And we're just going to focus on that first one because it means it can have a nice big font. When I fly from London to Manchester and I pay with cash, then I should pay 50 pounds for the flight and I should get 10 pounds tax and I should get 50 points. So I've added this detail that flights have a kind of identity that's um, from London to Manchester. This, this isn't going to affect the automation, really. Um, it's just deliberately adding these things, so when someone who works for airlines reads it, they think, oh yeah, flights to London to Manchester, that's like the real world that I operate in. Uh, I can get engaged in this conversation now. The harder thing is to actively seek terms from the domain. So it's quite easy to show this to someone and they say, yep, yeah, that's how it should work. You have to then drill in and say, is this really how you think about it? I've made, just in writing this, I've made a lot of assumptions about the domain model. <coughs> a flight goes between two points and has a cost. Uh, I don't want to like, start talking about databases or anything, but you can imagine like, a flight has a cost. Is that true? Are there changes in future where maybe there's multiple costs for the same flight? Do I want to design it in a way that's going to support those changes? I can only... Well, I can't mitigate the future too much, but I, well, a good way of mitigating the future is for me to build the system in a way that matches your understanding. The business thinks, of course, a flight is over here and a price is over here, and they're completely different things. I can come up with a new thing where we have 80 different prices for a particular flight. That's going to break my domain model if I didn't match your understanding. If my understanding was a flight had a price on it. it might be. Has anyone had that situation where a new business requirement completely breaks your domain model? Yeah, and you say that's going to take six months and we have to delete all the code and start again. And the business is saying, what the hell are you talking about? I just want two prices for one flight. 
So you have to ask questions like, what do you call this? I've used this word flight. Do you even call it a flight in your industry? Is there a better word I could use? I call it a flight because I look up in the sky and there's a plane and I say, look, a flight. You might have an industry term for it. Points, paying, cash. Do you call it cash? I mean, these are, might sound like stupid questions, but let, tell me how you think about it. Is the cost attached to a flight? Is this thing called tax? Or is that just the word I used when I wrote it down? What you're trying to do is understand how people in that business actually think about these systems. You want it to be in a point where the changes they ask for that completely break your domain model are also completely changing their business and they're having to reprint all their marketing material and it's a big change for them as well and they're firing people. And you want the easy stuff for the business to be easy stuff in the code. And you have to get good at listening. You sometimes spot that the business person you're talking to started using a different word to the word they were using yesterday and you say, hang on, you've started calling it this thing. Is that the word we should have used from the first place? So I might find out a bunch of things. A price doesn't belong to a flight. A price belongs to a fare, and a fare is attached to a route, and a route goes between two uh, airports. And the price isn't, any, isn't on the flight. There's like a listing system where I have to go and ask the fare listing system, I want to go from London to Manchester, what's the best price today? This is a simplification of how airlines actually work, by the way. I get quoted the cost when I buy the ticket. That's an important insight. If the price changes later, I don't have to pay more because I bought my ticket already. And I had a problem where historical data changes completely broke their domain model and all their old invoices had the wrong costs on them. I know I have. So this is the kind of thing that's going to help you. So you might end up with this. Given a flight XX100, because it turns out they have a way of assigning unique IDs to flights. I don't have to have an auto increment. There's actually a thing. <laughs> and the flight flies on a route, and a route is identified by two airports, LHR and MAN. And it turns out there's a way of having a unique ID for an airport as well. So again, I don't have to have this crazy MySQL number. And the current listed fare for Heathrow to Manchester is 50 pounds. So the, the whole new concept we didn't talk about before, that I just got to with conversation. There's, a, there's some sort of listing system that I have to consult, and that's maybe a different system. It's not just a table with the flight and the price. Or when I'm issued a ticket, so it's when I'm issued a ticket, and they call it issuing, they don't call it buying, because you pay later. And I pay 50 pounds cash for the ticket, the ticket should be completely paid, and the ticket should be worth 50 loyalty points. So it's the same scenario, there's just a lot more detail in there. And someone who's reading that is going to understand a lot more about the business. In terms of verifying it in a test, it's not really added a lot to the outline of the test I'd write. But because I'm going to use this to drive my code, all of these new concepts I learned about are going to be reflected in my code. So let's write some code. We do this first, maybe just for one scenario, or just one feature. We're going to start with the first scenario. The job of BHAT is to take a scenario written in Gherkin and some PHP code that you write and plug them together. And it says, when this line of the Gherkin gets hit, run this PHP code that the developer wrote. That's all it does. I mean, it does it really well, but... That's kind of all it does. So we, we configure a BHAT thing. This is just a YAML file config with BHAT. This isn't a BHAT tutorial, so I'm going to go fast through it to give you a flavor of what it feels like to work this way. So I say, well, there's a suite called core, and there's a class called flight context, and that's going to contain the code that you should execute. And then I make a flights context, and that's full of methods that look like this. And the methods are annotated with a pat nice little pattern that says, when you see a step in the Gherkin that looks like this, run this code. So I run it. I get this kind of output. Uh, and it stops on this first step, and it says, you haven't really told me what to do for this first step. So you now need to write some PHP. 
So as we go through, we're just step by step going to write some code that tests whatever the step says. And we're going to be driving the PHP directly. So we have given steps. This is existing context. In those steps, we're going to create the context. We have when steps, which is like something happens. We're going to do something. And there are then steps, where we check something. We're going to check something in PHP. So some interesting principles. Model values as value objects. Use objects for stuff. This is a very good practice. Um, you'll find in a lot of um, domains, a, lots of the logic is about how values are transformed or manipulated. There should be objects for that rather than just throwing strings around. So as I work through, what I'm going to do is read the English step and try and make code that really reflects the terminology used in the English and reflects the concepts being used. <coughs> so I've renamed some of the placeholders here. So when there's a step that's, the colon is a placeholder. When there's a step that's like given a flight with this number, flies from this origin to this destination, root, I'm just reading that and I'm trying to reflect that as closely as possible in my PHP. Uh, the same thing. So there's a thing called a flight. I'm going to instantiate a thing called flight. There's a thing called flight number. I'm going to make a, I've got a value object that represents a flight number. Can't be created with invalid flight numbers. That sounds handy. Um, and there's a thing called a route. And the route gets constructed with two airports. And the airports are constructed from the strings. So loads of the concepts from the conversation have now been dumped into PHP. Some of this instantiation can be shortcutted using a BHAT feature called transformations. This is just a quick way of um, doing this casting from strings to value objects. I won't go too much into it. But it basically simplifies my code and I get BHAT to do some of the value objects. Uh, transformation. So when I run bhat, I get an error because I haven't. None of these things exist. <laughs> so this is very much like TDD, right? I wrote the code that I want to exist, and I've spent my time thinking about that code's API, and now I have to write the code. And because I like unit tests, I'm. What do I do first when I need an object? Where do I start? Do I just make an object? Write a test. So I'm going to write a unit test for that object. So I've got these bhat tests and making sure the whole thing works together. I'm still going to write unit tests for the individual objects. I'm going faster. I use PHP spec. Um, <clears throat> so for example, this thing called an airport, it can be constructed from LHR. And then when you call as code, it should return LHR. If you're not familiar with PHP spec, don't worry about it. It's just unit testing. Uh, it can't be created with an invalid code. So if it's constructed from this weird code, it should throw an exception during instantiation. Very, very simple test, but just checking a few things that we want that um, class to display. And this will compel me to write the airport class. Uh, it can be constructed from a code. It's got a regex for the codes it likes. It can turn itself into a string again. I should probably put return types on this. It's the, it's the modern age now. Once I've done that, I can run bhat again, and that step now passes. So all of these objects that I, I do it for all of the objects, all of these concepts that I instantiated in that step now instantiate correctly, and I've got objects, and I've actually discovered a lot about my domain. I've got quite a few values modeled. So I go on to the next step. The currently listed fare for this route is this amount of money. <clears throat> and this is interesting because I have to think, do, am I building this fare listing service? Or is there one that exists already? There's probably one that exists already. So sometimes you find boundaries somewhere where you're going to talk to some other system and you just drop in an interface. Quite commonly, it's a database or some sort of repository. In this case, there's a list of fares, and I don't want to worry about it right now. So I'm going to make an interface. Because I'm reading this text, the current listed fare, so there's something called a current listed fare from a root 
is this amount. So I'm, I'm thinking about that terminology that came from a conversation. So there's a fair list. We're going to call that thing the fair list, and I can list the fair into it. I would have called it list, but that's a keyword in PHP. So you can't, ubiquitous language, you can't always match uh, exactly the, the thing. You're just trying to get as close as you can for whatever language you're using. <coughs> so you can list a fair between two roots. And then because I need an, an implementation of this, if you remember, we're not using real infrastructure, I'll just make an object that does that really naively. This is an object I'm just going to use in the tests to replace the real infrastructure. So it's a fake fair list, it just remembers the lists. It means I can write my step. The currently listed fair for the, between this root is this fair. I'm going to insert that into the fair list. So I'm just going through this cycle step by step, trying to reflect the concepts that are there. Run bhat, and that step now passes, it's green. It's complaining about the next one. I haven't defined what to do in the next step. So I am issued a ticket on a particular flight. <clears throat> Each step I'm doing a little bit of domain modeling. I've done some of my modeling in the conversation. Oh, there's a thing called a ticket, and it's issued on a flight. I verified that with a human who understood the business. So I've, I've got some understanding of the domain model. But on each step, I'm now having to think, how do I represent this in PHP? What does this look like in PHP? So you, what, that's a long way of saying, you might disagree with some of my design decisions here. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's just a point, for it's just an example, right? <clears throat> so I think a good way of representing a ticket being issued on a flight is to have a thing that issues tickets and I called it a ticket issuer. Maybe this is one of those points where I have to go and say, hey, what would you call that thing? And I can, change, I can change the step. So once I find out what the business calls that thing, I, I would try and capture that in the step and in the code. But there's a ticket issuer that needs to know about the fare list. And I say, please issue me a ticket on this flight. But again, this thing doesn't exist yet. The ticket issuer doesn't exist. And every time bhat fails in this kind of fatal error way, in fact, every time bhat fails, I then try and write a unit test that fails for the same reason. Uh, so this is a simple spec for a ticket issuer. It can issue a ticket for a flight. When I ask it to issue a ticket for a flight, I should get back something that's a ticket. So now it's going to catch it at a lower level of my testing. It's going to catch it quicker. And that makes me write some code, makes me define a class called ticket issuer that issues a ticket on a flight and it just returns a certain, just always returns a ticket that costs 100 pounds. So until I get to the then step in my scenario, I don't have to actually have any correct logic. I'm mostly modeling the relationships between things. So when you get to the then of the scenario, that stuff has to work. So I run bhat again. Now it's complaining it doesn't know what 50 pounds cash for the ticket is. The earlier steps normally have more concepts in them. So you're generating more objects in the early steps. And by the end, you're, you're just sort of adding new, new methods and new method calls. And of course, this is the first scenario. <clears throat> this is the first scenario in this feature. When we come to model the second feature, sorry, the second scenario, most of these objects will be in place. When I pay a certain amount for the ticket, I'm just going to Okay, I, should, I wrote the ticket object a minute ago. I'm going to add a pay method. And I call it pay because it says pay in the text. I don't have to think as much about what to call it because I thought about what to call it when I was talking to the rest of the team and talking to the business. Obviously, that doesn't work because pay doesn't exist. So I make a unit test that says you can pay tickets. That's a really bad unit test. It's going to get better. But for now, I just, I just want to be able to call this method without anything breaking. And this will compel me to write this amazing method. And then that step passes. So you've seen a couple of times that the, bit, the domain model is a bit anemic here, but there's not a lot of logic. And it's because only when we get to the then step of the scenario will we have to actually implement a lot of logic. And you, you need to hold yourself back a bit and not try and implement everything 
before you've got a failing test. So we get to the then step, the ticket should be completely paid. So I have to tell BHAT what to do. I say, assert that ticket is completely paid, returns true. This fails, because that doesn't exist yet. So I write a unit test that covers the same case and, and also fails. It's not completely paid uh, at the start. When you pay it, it is completely paid. And then I have to go and write some code to make that true. And typically at this point, you find you need to add some extra methods to the other objects for internal calls. So the BHAT is interacting from the outside, the kind of application API. Often the objects will then have to talk to each other a little bit, so you'll add a few, a few methods to those objects, and in each case you're adding unit tests. So I have to write some new unit tests for my fair object. I have to add some logic to the fair object. I then find some more unit tests I need to write for the fair. Change it. And then we get to the point where it works in that everything executes, but the logic doesn't work. The logic doesn't work because tickets, if you remember, I hard-coded a cost into the tickets. So I write a unit test that fails for the same reason. When I have a route between Heathrow and Manchester, I have a flight on that route, and I try and find the fare, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of duplicating it. And then I write the logic inside my objects to actually pass the tests. And then it's all passing. The next step, the ticket should be worth 50 loyalty points. I then have to do the same cycle again. The ticket should be worth 50 loyalty points. I assert that the number of points it's worth is 50. And then I write a unit test that captures the same thing and another unit test. And then I implement the logic in the object. And then I've got everything passing. So that's the, with the workflow. It's very uh, structured, which I like, because left to my own devices, I just read Reddit or something. Um, <clears throat> so I like to know what I'm doing next. It's also every step driven the code. So you'll have seen that the API of the code is really close to the language in the text. There's two steps to this chain. The language in the text, in, in the Gherkin, is really close to the way the business think. That has to be true. And then you have to have driven your objects very closely based on the Gherkin. And that means your domain model naturally maps the way the business thinks about things. So where is the domain model? This thing we generated is a domain model now. It's something someone can read and they understand a lot of the business concepts. On projects where we've put a lot of attention into this, we find new members can be on board a lot quicker because we've got these, these things you read and it's just explaining how the business works. So now that I know the objects work, I might want to go back and check the user interface works. Um, but importantly, I may have had 10 different scenarios explaining different pricing situations and different amounts of points earned. And the question you can ask yourself next is, do I need to test all of those again through the user interface? If I know that the controller just calls that method, and I know that the template just shows whatever the return value is, if one of those tests works through the user interface, probably all of them are going to work. Or if two are doing di significantly different things in the way the UI interacts with the application layer, you might need to test two of them. But because we've run all of our scenarios through the, the business objects first, and we know the business objects behave correctly, I might get away with just running one of the scenarios through the real user interface with the real database. The database might be doing fine by ID in each case. The user interface might be clicking the same button each time. And the only difference is the numbers that are popping up. And this is the point at which I build the user interface as well, of course. So I add a second suite to BHAP config. I say this is only going to run the scenarios that are tagged with a particular tag called UI. 
I pick one of the scenarios where I think, if that one works, I'm happy. I'm happy all the other UI, all the other scenarios will work through the UI. And then I'll go through the process of just for that one scenario, I'll write a different set of test automation that tests it through a browser by clicking on buttons and stuff. So our attention's focused on use cases. It helps you understand the core business domain. That's one of the biggest advantages, as well as having nicer code, you know. You're getting a better understanding of the business. It's going to encourage layered architecture because you're testing the core first. The test suite gets a lot faster because the majority of scenarios are being checked through the objects. And it's, it's ensuring your objects have an API that corresponds to these use cases. Use it when it's really important to get a good domain model. That's not all the time. Use it when you're likely to have to support future changes. So like, how long is this project going to be? How, how many iterations of different types of businesses are it going to support? And use it when you can have conversations with shareholders. If you can't, fix that. But you know, don't, it, it doesn't work as well. Don't use it when it's not core to the business. <coughs> you don't need it for prototypes if you know they're going to die. Um, don't use it if the thing's small enough that you could throw it away and rewrite it when the business changes. And it's a lot harder if you don't have access to business experts. So I've gone over, but I'm going to plug some things. Um, I organize a meetup called BDD London. On Monday, we're doing a workshop on this subject. It's at Skills Matter. You can find it by just Googling BDD London, and it's free. And uh, Constantine and I are going to facilitate a workshop in improving scenarios. Um, JetBrains are getting me to do a webinar next Thursday about PHP spec. So you saw a little bit of PHP spec there, but we'll, we'll do a demo and stuff. Uh, I work for Invica, and we launched a product called Continuous Pipe. So come and talk to us about it. Uh, and especially find the French guy with the beard, Sam, who did a lot of the coding and used a lot of these techniques to build Continuous Pipe. So it might be interesting. And please rate all the talks you see on Joined In. It means a lot to the speakers. I probably don't have time for questions. It's definitely not. <laughs> oh, OK. I thought I was being ushered off. OK, wonderful talk. Um, just one very quick question. Let's imagine I work for a company where the scenario is someone outside of the dev team from accounts or somewhere else goes, um, I want a website. I want cat gifts on it. I want it by Monday. How, do you, how would you advise you move a business that works in that way towards yeah. BDD and DDD principles? You might not need to. If, if the cat gifts are achieving the business goals, um, you don't need to have a strong domain model. I would start by starting at the project goal level and questioning why are we doing this project. <laughs> so you know, what, how will we know if this project's a success? What are we trying to achieve by this project? Can you explain how the cat gifts are going to make life better, uh, sort of walk backwards up to the rationale for the project. And then once you get that kind of buy-in, we're going to measure it. Maybe we'll have some metrics and see if it worked. Then that gives you more freedom to suggest other ways to achieve the same change in the metrics. If, if you're starting the conversation with a hard set of requirements, it's a lot harder. So you need to get more access to the strategic level. Why are we doing this? Maybe we can suggest different ways to achieve the same goals. And then you'll be able to apply this better. Uh, is that it? That's it. Um, I'll be at the Amica stand. Come and talk to us. I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs>